Welcome to the FaithBridge Sermon Podcast. Be sure to keep watching immediately after the sermon for Postscript, a weekly podcast with in-depth content and answers to your questions submitted during the sermon. You can also find it on iTunes or at faithbridge.org slash postscript. Ben Stewart needs no introduction here. He was our youth pastor for the first five years of the church, went on to become the director of Breakaway Ministries um, in College Station, did a bang up job there, grew the ministry. And then of course we talked about several months ago how God had called him to uh, go to Atlanta, Georgia. So he and his family now live in Atlanta. They are nesting at the Passion City Church. That's where he's on staff, pastored by Louis Giglio, where he's sort of in training uh, for a year or two, prepping to go out and to launch another Passion City Church in some other city that they haven't figured out what city it's going to be. And so that's what he's doing over there, but we still get to enjoy him uh, in, these, uh, uh, in a, this season. And uh, so I know you want to uh, welcome him warmly as he comes now to bring us God's word. Let's do that. Okay. Well, thanks. Well, howdy. howdy. It's good to be back in Texas. Uh, it's good to see you. If you have a Bible, we are in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Uh, if you don't have one, uh, there's some folks that are passing some out if you'd like one. Or uh, if you don't, I'm going to read it out loud. You'll see it on the screens and we'll all get there. But uh, 1 Corinthians 12, uh, we'll start in verse 1. I want to read a few verses to you. Uh, we'll pray and then jump in. <clears throat> so 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Uh, beginning in verse 1, uh, says this. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to mute idols, however you were led. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking in the Spirit of God ever says Jesus is accursed. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. Now, there are a variety of gifts, but the same spirit. There are a variety of of service, but the same Lord. There's a variety of activities, but it's the same God who empowers them all and everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the spirit for the common good. Uh, Now, I'm going to skip to verse 11. All these are empowered by one and the same spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. For just as the body is one and has many members and all the members of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slave or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. Let me pray for us. Lord, thank you for this moment around your word. I I do pray, God, you would help us right now, not just hear a presentation, Lord, but really that you would give us eyes to see what's happening in our culture and eyes to see ourselves and our own lives and own decisions in the midst of it. And then, Father, I pray you would give us eyes to see your word, what it is you have to say to your people as we live in these days. And I pray, Father, that we would walk in accordance with your word, that you would affect the way we think, the way we feel, the way we see, and the way we move through this world as a result of these few minutes together. And and I can't create that, and, a, and a, a sermon can't, but, but you can. And so we're asking you to meet with us and, and change us. And if you're willing, I would just ask you to take a minute and pray and ask him that. Say, Lord, please teach me something this morning. And then if you would, please pray for me that the Lord would use me and I'd be helpful to you. Well, Father, we love you and we trust you. Use this time and we pray that in Jesus' name, amen. Well, several months ago, it rained in my house uh, and the preposition there matters, not at my house, uh, in my house, uh, in my living room to be exact. Um, Apparently there had been a leak at our balcony and water had journeyed along some wood and accumulated as such until it broke forth uh, and rained upon my couch. 
So we brought the professionals in and they cut a big hole, dried out everything, repaired the leak, got the sheetrock back, wood back, all that kind of stuff. But they brought in a dehumidifier, massive machine, and had it running there for over a week. And this thing is just pulling water out. There was a hose that ran from it uh, into our sink and uh, it was just sucking out water. And after a day or two, the wood was dry, sheetrock's dry, there's no pool of water on the floor. Uh, but for about the next seven days, every few minutes, water would just come streaming out of this hose uh, into the sink. And, and not just like a trickle, like pouring out. And as I'm watching that, I'm like, that's, that's not coming from like a pool of water in the house. Where's that coming from? And then it just took a moment to think about it. It's a dehumidifier. It's pulling humidity out of the air. And I knew the Houston area was humid. You know, like we all get that. Like Sam Houston lied to us. He got us all here and we found out later how humid it was. I get it. But it was interesting to see it pulled out and you go, there are gallons of water being sucked out of the air in my house. And I'm like, I breathe that. And as soon as I saw that, I'm like, it suddenly made so many things make sense. Like when I go visit friends in drier climates, like I get off the plane and instantly my lips crack and I get a headache. I'm like, that's why? Because my lungs are accustomed to being bathed in a certain amount of water uh, and we're all part amphibian down here. And uh, I just didn't realize it till someone pulled it out and showed it to me. And you say, well, why do you mention that? Because, because we're all like this that there are factors in our environment that are affecting us, are changing us, that we're completely unaware of. We can't see them uh, until someone pulls it out and shows it to us. And that's true culturally. That socially in our country today, there are factors around us that are shaping how you see God, how you see yourself, and how you see the world and operate in it. There are factors in our country, and really over the last 10 years, some significant changes in our country that have affected us. The way we even think about God, the way we think about ourselves and other people, and they are affecting us, changing us, whether we're aware of them or not. And sometimes the most gracious thing a person can do is pull it out and show us how we're being affected. And so that's what I wanna do today and and next week is pull out some factors in the culture that are affecting us and particularly affecting the young among us as they're growing up at a time of such radical cultural change. And let me tell you why I'm doing it. I'm not doing it to try to shame people like this is where the world's going today. it's, It's to give you information so that we can make informed decisions. So I know where the currents of culture are going and I can decide whether or not I want to be drug along by them or not. And so I want to spend a few minutes examining the culture, and then I want to look at the eternal word of God and let it speak to our temporal circumstances. And what I want to look at specifically today is modern spirituality, our, our relationship with religion. Because Pew Research has put out the data that 25% of millennials, and millennials are basically people under 35. So 25% of millennials, one out of every four, are unaffiliated with any religious faith. That they're unaffiliated with religion. That is significantly more than any other generation in America at that time in their lives. Baby boomers, when you were that age, it was one out of every 10 that would say, no, I'm not religious. Nine out of 10 would say they were. One out of every four millennials are unaffiliated with any religion. That's a massive increase. And yet the fascinating thing is one out of every four say, I am unaffiliated with religion. And yet when asked if they pray weekly, more of them say they pray weekly than any generation before them at that particular age. And the same amount believe in God, heaven, hell, miracles, and afterlife. They believe the same rough rough doctrinal ideas that their forebears did, right? And not only that, you don't see a massive uptick in our country of atheism or agnosticism. Atheism's up about 1%. Agnosticism's up 1% to 2% of I don't know if there's a God. So some people herald this loss of religion as this increase in atheism, but it's not. And so you go, then what is it? They're less religious, but they pray more, believe roughly the same doctrinal things, and they're not atheists? What, What does that mean? Well, the key is that word I mentioned earlier, unaffiliated, that they're religiously unaffiliated, which I had to look up the definition of. Let me read it to you. It means not officially attached or connected to an organization or group. 
So what you see happening, particularly over the last 10 years, is not a large-scale disconnect from belief in God. It's a large-scale disconnect from religious institutions. So a popular phrase in our culture today, among all ages, is for someone to say, I'm spiritual, but not religious. You go, what does that mean? What they mean is, I want to acknowledge a spiritual world. I believe there's, that I'm more than just biology. I think there's a spiritual world out there, but I don't want to be connected to like an organization of like you people, right? And so that's the separation. And so Pew Research asked millennials, our young people today, how many of you attend religious services on a regular basis? Only 18% said yes. Your parents' generation, baby boomers, it was way more than twice that. And so of those who are religiously affiliated, of young people, they would say, I am connected with the religion. When asked, do you go to services weekly? Less than half said yes. It's interesting. So Barna did a study and he asked people, how do you grow in your faith here in America? And people gave different factors. Oh, you pray, you read your Bible, family members, having kids, th different things like that. Church did not land in the top 10. Didn't land in the top 10. And you go, what is driving that? Why? Well, and some people would say it's because it's hypocrisy in the church. It's because the leaderships uh, are liars and fakes and that kind of stuff. And let me just say this. I've counseled a lot of people that have had pastors or religious leaders say things to them that are unconscionable to me, indefensible, and I'm not going to defend them. But I say, I don't know what I would do if someone in religious leadership said that to me when I was your age. But what I say to them and would just say to you briefly is this, I've had some horrible doctors in my life without question, but it's not turned me off the whole idea of medicine. And there have been some church experiences and leaders that have done some horrible things in the name of religion, but don't write off the whole concept because of those guys. But the interesting thing is the vast majority of Americans who are disconnecting, it's not that reason. The reasons they give are, I find God elsewhere and church isn't relevant to me personally. That's what they say. I find God other places, and what you do here is not relevant to me. But notice the language of that. I can find God for me somewhere else. I am not finding this helpful to me. What's driving this disconnect is individualism. Individualism. So June Ann Greenlee, who is a philosophy professor at Sacred Heart University, they interviewed her at CNN about what's with these spiritual but not religious people, and she said this, people seem not to have the time, nor energy, nor interest to delve deeply into one faith or religious tradition. So they move through, collecting ideas, practices, tenets that most appeal to the self, but making no connections to groups or communities. So Dr. Jean Twenge, who studied this in depth, said this. She said, we found that religious involvement is low where individualism is high. Individualism is a cultural system that places more emphasis on self and less on social rules. And so individualism can come in conflict with religion, especially as religion involves certain rules or being part of a group. Individualism focuses on the self and personal choices. So what's happening here? It's not an anti-spiritual movement in the sense that people want a connection with God. It's an anti-social movement. I want God, I just don't want you and I don't wanna be in a group with you because you're a hassle. And yet some people hear that and go, well, I'm not antisocial. I got tons of friends on Facebook. Well, yeah, <laughs> we're more connected, but we're not more communal. It's interesting, there's a study that's been going on since the 1950s where they've asked the question, how many people do you know you could call in a crisis? Like when your world comes crashing down and you gotta call someone late at night, how many people do you know that you could call and they'd come running in your time of need? That number has been decreasing since the 1950s. The square footage of our homes has been increasing. So this isn't just a young people problem like the kids today. You're like, we raised the kids of today. <laughs> it's an American issue. I want more space. I don't wanna be around you people. That's the message of the last few years. So I talked with a group of people around this of going, do you see this? And I had one young lady tell me, she's like, I was in the grocery store the other day. She's like, I couldn't find something. So I looked up and she's like, and I saw a store clerk. And she's like, I just didn't even notice it. I looked at him and then just pulled out my phone and was like, Siri, where's the cantaloupe, you know? 
She said, and I stopped and realized I'd rather talk to my personal little computer than to talk with another human being, right? And here's the deal. None of this is to blame you or anything like that, but it's affecting you. And it's affecting our kids. And it's not the kids' fault. We've done this. So Huffington Post, which is by no stretch of the imagination a conservative or religious paper, <laughs> wanted to write an article about what are the significant changes we're seeing among college students in the world today. And so they used a UCLA study that interviewed over 150,000 college students from over 200 universities, and they found four major trends among young people in our culture today. Trend number one is they're considerably less religious. One out of every four freshmen, when asked, what religion are you affiliated with, said none. One out of four. Way higher than ever before. So religion's down. Major trend number two is stress and depression are way up. Exponentially. And so the director of the program at UCLA said, we see a direct correlation between their increase of stress and feeling overwhelmed and their lack of socialization. When students were asked, how many of you spend 16 hours or more spending time with your friends talking, only 18% of them said they do. It was more than double that seven years ago. The culture's moving. And so you see less affiliation, connection, and what do you see? An increase in depression, and you see an increase in drug treatment facilities on college campuses because addiction's an intimacy disorder. If I can't get my needs met in a right way with a human being, I can get them met with a pill, with a bottle, with porn. I go other places. And so you see a, additional counseling services need on college campuses, and you see an increase in sexual violence. So what's happening? Our young people are hurting because of this movement towards individualism. It's isolation, and it's hurt them. And it's not just hurt them, it's not just hurting us, it's gonna hurt the world. University of Michigan did a study of young people and they found that empathy levels on college campuses have dropped over 40%. Empathy, meaning the ability to step in someone else's shoes and try to understand their point of view. That is diminishing rapidly in our world today that what I can do in the world today is not have to interact with you if I disagree with you, if you're different from me. All I have to do is get my own little circle of people on my own little social media world that all tend to agree with me, look like me, and I'll hang out with them. And so when I hear about another group that believes differently, I go, well, they're stupid, bad, and should be silenced. And that's our world today. And you see in the young, it's affecting them with a decrease of even attempting to empathize with what someone else may be going through. So the individual's being hurt and society's being hurt. Individualism has led to isolationism and being unaffiliated has made us unfulfilled. And let me tell you something, this tendency in our country to everyone just silo off with your own little groups of people and begin to lob bombs at that other group of people, that terror at our fabric in our country, it's gonna make a mess. And there's gotta be a better way. There has to be a better way than where we are right now. And there is a better way. God's building a family. God is building a community. God is building a church. And so it's interesting. People say, man, I want to be spiritual but not religious. And Paul, as he wrote to the Corinthians, said, I want to tell you what true spirituality is. How do you know you're in step with the actual spirit of God? How do you know you're walking with him? And as he wrote to them, he gave them two markers that you can know to be spiritual. The first one he gave us when he said, no one speaking of the spirit of God says Jesus is accursed, but no one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. He said, how do you know you are truly spiritual? It's because you call Jesus Christ your Lord. The truly spiritual person acknowledges not that, that Jesus was a nice guy or even that he just died on the cross, but he died for my sin, buried, rose again, and now rules supreme over this world and me and my decisions. Jesus is Lord is the first way you know the spirit of God is moving in your life. And then the second way you know the spirit of God, that you are truly a spiritual person, is he moves you toward community. And you saw it in the text we read, I won't read it all again, but he starts talking about how gifts have been given by the spirit and to each is given a manifestation of the spirit for the common good. And all of us are empowered by the same spirit who apportions to each individual as he wills for this one body. And what you see is true spirituality always works itself out in the context of community. That how do you know I'm truly walking with the spirit? He moves us into community. Ephesians 2 says it, that in Christ, we are being built together into one dwelling place for God by the spirit. And so if your spirituality has not led you into community with us, you got something, but don't call it spirituality. 
Because the Holy Spirit says, Jesus is my Lord and you are my brothers. You are my sisters. The followers of Jesus is a family. How do you know your truly spiritual spirituality always works itself out in the context of community? That's what God is doing. And if you look at the community he's building, did you see it? It says Jews or Greeks, slave or free, all are made to drink of one spirit, all baptized into one body. That the spirit of God takes disparate people and pulls them together into a family. So he took Jew and Greek, people that could not have been farther apart socially, and pulls them together into one body. He took slave and free. You think there were some issues between those two communities? And the Spirit of God weaves them together into one body, one family, because true spirituality works itself out in community, and that community is a unity of diversity. God pulls together people that wouldn't hang out in any other way except when they come to him and he knits us together in one body. That's how you know you're truly spiritual as God begins to draw us together. You saw it in Jesus. As he pulled his 12 together, his inner ring, he grabbed a tax collector and a zealot. Someone who worked for the government and someone who had sworn to overthrow the government. And they were in his inner circle of 12. You think there was some tension there? Then one of them says, I want to follow you, Jesus. And he's like, well, come on then, meet the boys. He's like, yeah, I'd love to. No, no. No, I'm not rolling with that guy. And Jesus says, you want to ride with me? Then I'm going to put you together in a family, brothers and sisters with people from different political parties (laughs) and different races and different backgrounds and different viewpoints and different experiences in the world, and I'm going to bring a unity out of diversity into a community. Why does he do that? Let me give you three reasons before we close. The first is he does it for his glory. It brings God glory to bring unity out of diversity. That's why he does it. So it's not just true of God. That's true of everybody. I mean, think about it. If I said, dude, you got to try this new restaurant out. And you're like, why? And I was like, man, it's such a hit with the over 65 crowd. Like, I mean, like the AARP set just loves this place. You'd probably go, eh. But if I said people from all different races, backgrounds, strata, different parts of the country, all pulling together to have this barbecue sandwich, you would say, I got to try it. Why? Because it gets elevated in your mind if it brings unity out of diversity. If I said, man, you got to hear this new music. Why? Oh, dude, 11 to 13-year-old white girls love it. (laughs) You'd say, I don't really want to hear it. (laughs) But if I said, there's a song that people from every tribe and tongue and nation are singing. It's bringing the world together. You would say, play me that song. Why? Because it gets more glory if it brings unity around diversity. How do you know you're truly spiritual? Spirituality moves toward community. God draws us in together. That's what he does. So I hear people say it to me. Well, Ben, I got my Bible, I got podcasts, and I got my friends in my living room. That's church, man. You tell us, I I, I need some friends, I need the truth, I got the truth, and I got community. I got it, man. So I got church. Why would I need to go hang out with you guys? And what I say to them and want to say to you is, if I planted a church, let's say I planted a church, I started one, and I put a sign out front that said, all are welcome, provided you're between the ages of 30 and 50, white, make about this much a year, and aren't homeless. Would you come to my church or would you picket it? You'd say, how dare you? That's wrong. The gospel's available to all. And I say, well, when you decide to just silo off among your friends, I would guess they make around the same amount as you and look a whole lot like you and believe a lot of what you do. So you didn't kick the homeless guy out. You just made sure he could never find you. God's not like that. God says, I'm going to pull people together from all different strands. Why? Because I get more glory that way. I get more glory when people see all kinds together in love. But it's hard. It's hard. Anne Rice was an atheist for much of her life, was famous for writing vampire books, became a Christian later in life. And then 10 years after walking with Christ, she issued this statement online. Today, I quit being a Christian. I'm out. 
I remain committed to Christ as always, but not the being Christian or being part of Christianity. It's simply impossible for me to belong to this quarrelsome, hostile, disputatious, and deservedly infamous group. For 10 years I've tried, I've failed. I'm an outsider. My conscience will allow nothing else. In the name of Christ, I quit Christianity. My faith in Christ is central to my life. My conversion from a pessimistic atheist lost in the world I didn't understand to an optimistic believer in a universe created and sustained by a loving God is crucial to me, but following Christ does not mean following his followers. Christ is infinitely more important than Christianity. And there's something noble about that. I follow Christ, not these people. But I just think it sounds so different from Luke chapter 6 where Jesus said, but I say to you, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. If you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? Even sinners do the same. But love your enemies. Do good and lend, expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great, You'll be sons of the Most High, for he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Be merciful, even as your Father is merciful. Jesus said, you know, want to know how glory is going to come to my Father? The gospel will be legitimized when love overflows the expected banks in our society. People expect you to like people that look like you and believe in you and agree with you. They don't expect your love to extend beyond your social sphere, much less to your enemies. Jesus said, but when you come to me, my love overflows even to those you would call your enemy and you love them. The gospel will be legitimized. God gets more glory when people see our love overflow the expected banks. So if you say, man, I just love Jesus. He's made my friendship group so much tighter. And you're like, wow, Jesus made you more friendly with your friends? (laughs) Hallelujah. (laughs) How can it be? I like the people I like even more. Well, that's great. But if the spirit of God is moving in your life, Jesus is your Lord, and then your brothers and sisters come from a lot of different places, Jews, Greeks, slave, free, and the power of God is displayed when there's that unity and diversity, I promise you. So to John Perkins, make an incredible difference when he wrote as an African-American pastor about his experience in the 60s and his movement, and his involvement in the civil rights movement. His books were pretty powerful, had a big effect on me. And he wrote some with other civil rights leaders. Which is pretty, they're pretty amazing. But when he wrote a book with a former Klansman, that's something else entirely. When you say two people where it'd be very easy to stay on opposite sides of the fence, come together as brothers, that's power. That's the gospel. That's what the spirit of God does that no one else can really do. Right? So if you want to love God, you love his kids. You want to love me, you love my children. So to say I love God, but I hate his kids, it's weird. It's not like that. We love one another. For his glory and for our growth, it's good for us. You see, he says, to each is given the manifestation of the spirit for the common good. All these are empowered by one and the same spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. The spirit's gonna give different gifts to different ones. And then he arranges us for the common good, for our growth. Here's the problem with people that wanna tailor make their spirituality. It's built off a false assumption. And what's the false assumption? that you actually know what you need. That's so arrogant. Well, I know I just need to listen to these podcasts and read these books and then I'm gonna be spiritual. That is such an arrogant assumption that you actually know what you need. Match.com, largest connector of people uh, romantically in our country. Match.com used to have an algorithm where you punch in everything you're looking for in a mate. You gotta look like this, you gotta have this kind of hair, they gotta have these interests, pop, pop, pop. And they did a massive study of the millions of people on Match.com and they found absolutely zero correlation between what people say they want romantically and who they actually marry. Zero. <laughs> and what they found is people don't know what they want. They're like my roommate in college. I was like, I want a girl that's kind of wild, all tatted up. He married a sweet little girl that had never kissed a boy. (laughs) I married the crazy tatted up one. You don't know what you want. 
We don't know. It's arrogant to say that. So when I was in college, I was already leading, already preaching up front. And so I started to think, man, I kind of got this. And then I remember coming to Faith Bridge and sitting around with a group of a, a dozen people and this woman in her 70s sitting next to me and is telling the story about this couple's life. And as she's telling the story, she was like, yeah, so I just felt this uh, burden for them. And so I spent all night fasting and praying and I feel like the Lord's doing this. And I was like, da, 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 wait, 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 what? You spent all night praying? Like, but like, when did you go to sleep? She's like, no, I prayed all night. And all the other people in the circle were like, yeah, yeah, I prayed all night. I'm like, wait, what? And you fast like without food? Like I understand fasting from like sadness or something, but like you didn't eat food just to pray? And I realized suddenly in that moment, as big time as I thought I was, I was spiritually a dwarf compared to this woman. But never in my life did I ever pray, God, please send me a 70 year old woman to help me grow spiritually. I need a Marsha God. I didn't even know to look for that. I didn't. So when I lived in a church in the inner city of Denver, I remember one of my favorite parts about it was walking in and at the reception desk, there was a massive Hispanic young man, tatted up, came from a very rough background and, and lived a very hard life on the streets. And he ran the front desk with this little bitty old white lady. And they were best friends, best friends. And they were so sweet to each other, so tender to each other. He had a disease from some decisions he'd made as a young man. And she was the first one to take care of him, drive him to the doctor's office, whatever he needed. And as she aged, he was so gentle and caring for her. And you look at that connection and you go, I doubt either one of them prayed for this. Lord, I just really need a little old white lady in my life. I doubt it. Lord, I just need a massive Hispanic guy from the streets. You don't even know what you're missing. The spirit apportions to each one as he wills. He gets to decide. You don't. And so he's going to put gifts in different people and he's going to draw us together across economic lines, racial lines, political lines to learn from each other, to grow. That's what the spirit does. I needed a Marsha. I needed some junior high kids to show me how selfish I was. I didn't know how self-centered I was until I led a Bible study of little junior high kids and realized I don't love them. And I had to repent and ask God to help me. And, and they, they changed my life. They really did. I needed Kwame to tell me what it's like to grow up as a young black man in America. Because, I don't know, you think you know from TV shows or something. But as a white kid from the suburbs, I had no idea what he experienced until he had the patience to talk me through it and to not give up on me when it would have been easier to. And I needed that. And I think he needed me. And I think us siloing off to just hang out with people that look like us is a big mistake. And it's not what the Spirit of God is doing. True spirituality sees Jesus as Lord and it's drawing together unity out of diversity for God's glory and our growth. Some of you, the most Christian thing you'll do is to initiate conversations across the expected banks of your social boundaries with some people you could learn from. Because the world needs it. That's the last piece. It's for the world's good. The world needs to see this. The world needs to see it. Because our culture is getting great at getting us into our little circles and demonizing the other circles. We're doing a lot more yelling and a lot less listening and it's tearing our country apart. And let me tell you something, no political agenda is gonna fix the hurt here. No set of laws is gonna change a human heart. But Jesus can. And he prayed in John 17 for us. He said, I don't ask just for these only, meaning the people who are with him. He says, but I pray for those who will believe in me through their word. He's talking about us. That they may be one just as you, Father, are in me and I am in you, may they be in us so that the world may believe you sent me. 
The glory that you've given me, I've given to them that they may be one, even as we are one. I and them, you and me, may they be brought to perfectly one so that the world may know you sent me and loved them even as you loved me. Did you hear what Jesus just said? His prayer was that we would be one and then he gave you a so that, a result, that when we are, the world will know you sent me. The gospel will be legitimized when the world sees us get along. And so there's a lot of people wanting to lift up movements around the country today and a lot of those movements are really shot through with anger that just wanna win. And we need to show them a better way as a church. And how do we do that? I've been online for the last week and seen so many ignorant and unhelpful and cruel and insensitive things tweeted out by people from all different sides of the different divisions in our country. And then I saw one little ray of hope and it was a picture from a prayer gathering in Dallas. And you look at that and you go, there's, there's two communities that know hurt. There's two communities that know loss. And it would be so easy for them to be ripped apart. And yet the believers say, but I will love and I will move towards you to seek understanding and I will move towards you to seek healing. That's the beauty of the gospel that Jesus Christ gave his life to reconcile us to God and at that same moment reconcile us to each other that he's taking Jew and Gentile, slave and free, and knitting them together in one body in the spirit. What the world needs to see is us love each other. And I don't mean us like, yeah, church, y'all should love each other. I'm talking to you individually. What will you do? Because if you are a spiritual person, the spirit of God is gonna move you into community with people who aren't like you. And as you let your love flow over the expected banks, the world will see something they're not finding anywhere else the power of the gospel to heal and to reconcile. And I pray that would be our story here for the glory of God and our growth and, and the good of this country. Let me pray for us. Well, Lord, I, I wanna pray for the people in this room that are not reconciled to you. There's some in here that they don't know the gospel. They just thought religion was be a good person and, and it's not. It's an acknowledgement that, like Ken said, we are broken from, from the earliest days brothers were killing brothers and every human being is broken. And we must all come and kneel before the cross of a Jesus who took on our sin and shame and buried it and offers forgiveness for all who will acknowledge him as their Lord. And I believe some in here need to do that and say, I need Jesus, I want him. And God, I wanna thank you and I just want to encourage you, if that's you, you cry out and tell him that right now. And then you please tell some of us here. And then God, for all of us that are in Christ, the moment God becomes our father, then Christ becomes our brother and the Christian becomes our brother and sisters and mothers and sons and daughters. We become family. And I pray, Father, we would follow the guidance of your spirit to love one another and not just the one another's that look like us. I pray, God, that we would be people that could move out into our community, quick to listen, quick to initiate listening. What's it like to be you? When you see that picture, what comes to mind for you? What do you think? How can I pray for you? I pray empathy would rise. As the culture loses it, I pray they would see white hot love here among the people of Jesus. And that, God, you would get more glory than ever as the world seeks a million answers that can't satisfy, I pray they would see what we have and more glory would come to you, more growth would come to us and more good would come to our country. May we lead in a better way as we follow you, God. We love you and pray that in Jesus' name. Welcome to Postscript. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the messages and sermons at FaithBridge by talking with the teacher of the day.
and welcome to Postscript. I'm Lou Ann Riley, Grow Group and Discipleship Director, and I'm here with Bible teacher Ben Stewart, who just brought a message on community. Welcome, Ben. Thanks. So glad to have you Good back. Year. Thanks yeah. for um, coming in and updating us on your family in Atlanta, you're moved. Yeah, All we in, are, we're settled, settled in. in and yeah. good. Uh -huh. um, well, we love having you back today and what a great timely message um, with everything that's happening and going on and just looking at our culture mm. and how that does affect us. And one of the things you talked a lot about was just this growing individualism mm -hmm. um, of people. And so one of the questions that came in was around that. In terms of individualism and sense of entitlement, it seems like as parents we're just fighting against this tide or this flood of culture. How right. can we fight against that as parents with our children? How can we try to shift our children against the culture? Yeah, that's a great question. And you know, it's, um, I'm gonna have to speak a little hypothetically because my kids are little bitty and we're just entering into this with them. But that's something Donna and I have talked about of, we don't just wanna to communicate to our kids, hypothetically one should be engaged in community. We wanted them to see that in our lives. So we are um, constantly inviting People, you know, couples from the church into our home. Mm -hmm. um, we are getting involved in serving projects out in the city with our kids. Mm -hmm. So we just recently were involved in a project in Atlanta where we were able to go help and did like this barbecue for this apartment area and brought our kids, you know, mm -hmm. and they were great conversation starters, you know, because yeah. little kids are adorable. And we just want our kids in that rhythm of, we step outside our home mm -hmm. to serve other people. And, um, as a pastor, you got to balance that where you don't then suddenly have no time where you're just listening to them, you know, but we have time socially with just our family, just our kids. But we also, we want a rhythm where they see it's normal to serve. It's normal to give, uh, whether that be on a Sunday morning at a church building or in the community through initiatives the church is doing. We wanted our kids to be, um, see that as a normal part of life and, and, and get an exposure, a broader circle than just maybe our home could give them. Mm -hmm. So that's, good. that's maybe a, a simple thing I could I say. I mean, seeing the, them seeing you live it, live it out. Yeah, that's absolutely. Cool. Yeah. And, and them being a part of it in mm -hmm. inappropriate ways, mm -hmm. you know, bringing Engaging them into them. it as well. Bringing them into absolutely. it. Absolutely. Um, okay. So one of the questions that we had come around, um, it, it's, it's, it's a long situation, but what it boils down to really is you talked a lot about the heart behind mm -hmm. diversity and unification and how the gospel calls us to reach across borders and banks. Um, what then is a more, is a practical step? You know, as you, as you feel moved by the Holy Spirit, engaged to yeah. be an ambassador and reconciliation, what's a practical step? Yeah. Uh, well, one of the most, there's a lot we could say, but I'll just say one thing. One of the most fascinating things to me in Sermon on the Mount, you know, Jesus is talking about loving your neighbor and even loving your enemy. But then he says, um, greet. Don't just greet your friend. But And you're like, that's so interesting that he takes this massive thing of loving your enemies and puts it down on the simple act of greeting someone. Like he really does funnel it all down. But when you start to think about that, what do we do? I, I greet my friends and everybody else. I just walk right on by you wow. and I greet my friends, you know? And so I would just say, rather than go, suddenly you have to be out and involved in all these organizations. I would say, begin to pray now and say, Lord, let me be aware of the world around me and let me initiate kindness and not necessarily go, oh, I got to suddenly become friends with someone who's doesn't look like me, but just say, I, I want to be a source of life. And, and the way to do that is to greet people, <laughs> you know, just to be kind to them. And so that's anything simple from frequenting the same restaurant and looking people in the eye and saying hello to them. We'll suddenly build a relationship between you and someone that probably lives a very different world than you. Um, and then it may extend beyond to further conversation, but all conversations start with a greeting. Yeah. And I found for me in life, I'm more naturally introverted. I'm not the guy running around the room trying to shake everybody's hand. But I pray that, Lord, help me when I'm in a room, be present. And as I've done that, the Spirit of God moves us towards community, mm. it's a diverse community, and you start to find, like in a time of racial tension now, I found, Lord, 
thank you that, you know, a couple of years ago, I realized I don't know anybody that's not white. And that really doesn't feel right. And, uh, but I'm not going to suddenly start chasing down <laughs> every black or Hispanic person I see. <laughs> but I started praying for that and I was kind to people. And as that, and God naturally looped things around and I'd say, hey, I'd love to go to lunch and ask you questions or in a moment like this, go, hey, how do you see this? When you read that article, what comes to mind for you? And um, engaging people. But it starts with a greeting. That's Again, good. that sounds simple, but maybe that's the and best I place to start. I love what you said about the lack of empathy because... Truly, when you engage with people and you begin to hear their story, yeah. um, God just opens your eyes and your heart to so many people's different backgrounds and how they've grown. And I think that's one of the great things about grow groups is getting to hear people's stories and right. see where they came from. Yeah. Um, such such a good message. Now, you mentioned a book that everyone mm -hmm. wants to know the title to um, by John Perkins. Yes. Um, and we did look that up. What was the name it of the book? It was called My Brother. He is My Brother? He is My Brother. He is My there Brother. Did. He is there My he Brother. Is. Yes. He is My Brother. And it, I did find it on Amazon. So yep. you yeah. can purchase it there. So absolutely. Um, and John Perkins is... Uh, he has a number of great resources, and so you can listen to him speak or read some of his books, but the one specifically I referenced is He's My Brother. Great. Awesome. Yeah. Well, great message, but we can't wait to have you back again Thanks. Looking next forward to week, myself. two weeks in a row. All right. Yeah. Um, thank you for joining us here for Postscript as well. We'll see you back next week. Thanks for joining us for Postscript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org postscript.